All right, good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's complimentary educational webinar, How to Reduce Expenses and Maximize Enterprise Value, which will be presented by Miles Lee, President and CEO of Alliance, of Alliance Cost Containment. My name is John Polis and I am the Chief Operating and Technology Officer for your webinar host, Star Mountain Capital, and I'll be your moderator today. A little bit about Star Mountain, we are a specialized asset management firm focused on investing in the, in the large and underserved U.S. lower middle market of companies with typically under $15 million of EBITDA. Star Mountain's differentiated business model includes a custom-built media and technology platform bringing proven large market resources to smaller businesses as a value-added lender and investment partner. Before I hand over the reins to Miles, I did want to let you know that your audio is muted and will be for the entirety of our presentation today. Also, we have allocated time at the end of, your, of the presentation for Q&A. If you do have a question, you can type it into the Q&A chat box of your WebEx client. We will try to get to as many questions as possible before our time is up. Now about our presenter. Miles Lee is the CEO and President of Alliance Cost Containment, a firm that provides cost reduction services that allows all types of companies to maximize operating revenue. Miles has led the company's impressive growth since acquiring the business in 2007. He has over 20 years of executive strategic sourcing and group purchasing experience with a focus on cost reduction for lower middle market businesses. Under Miles' leadership, Alliance Cost has received numerous awards, including Best Places to Work 2017, Business of the Year finalist from Business First 2017, Inc. 5,000 Fastest Growing Private Companies 2016, 2017, 2018, and Business First Fast 50 Award 2017. Miles, we're very happy to have you with us today. John, thank you very much for that introduction. Really appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, the audience today, and we appreciate our partnership with Star Mountain. Um, a brief background about uh, Alliance Cost Containment, or ACC, we specialize in uh, indirect cost reduction, helping businesses take out uh, their indirect costs, and we'll talk a little bit about that and the def definition and meaning of that. Um, we uh, are a firm, a you know, privately held firm, specialize, like I said, in indirect cost reduction. We have three channels. We, we target uh, single enterprise clients, generally speaking, with revenues of 50 million and higher. Um, we work directly with a number of private equity firms and financial sponsors and help their uh, portfolio build value. And the third is we go into fragmented communities and build uh, buying groups or purchasing cooperatives to help uh, smaller businesses purchase with strength of a Fortune 500 company. So that's a little bit about um, ACC. Today we're going to talk, you know, kind of about indirect expenses and about the impact on uh, a company's bottom line, and then talk about at a high level some best practices and uh, suggestions based on our, you know, 20 years experience of uh, helping companies improve their profit. So first, let's talk about the definition of, you know, indirect expense. Essentially, at a high level, and most of you, I'm sure, realize this is are expenses incurred to operate, you know, a business that generally not associated with the product or service that's being sold. We've you know, identified about 35 areas that we commonly work with in the indirect expense space, and I'll show a little slide of that in a minute. Um, depending on the industry a client is in, it can be as much, indirect expenses as collectively can be as much as 40 to 50% of all expenses with third-party vendors. So while each category singularly may not be a huge dollar impact, collectively it is, and that's something that kind of gets lost in the translation of, uh, of a company's expenses at times. Um, these expenses are you know, very hard to you know, pull together because of the fragmentation. Most times the vendors will have the leverage because of uh, you know, that relatively small volume that companies purchase in these areas. Uh, in addition, most companies you know, don't have a ton of you know, resources dedicated to this, so it makes it more difficult for uh, businesses to effectively manage the indirect expense space. This is just a screenshot of some of the categories um, that are, um, you know, we consider indirect expense. Uh, generally speaking, you know, they're going to come out of either the, you know, kind of the you know, manufacturing, IT, HR, or finance area. That, that's where the, the decisions, uh, if not made centrally, are uh, made for these categories. But I think the more important point is it's a high velocity of activity managed by a low resource load. And that's the, um, that's kind of the 
challenge for most businesses in, in order of in terms of trying to effectively you know manage the expenses you know the common misconceptions you know essentially it boils down to you know we don't think from a company's perspective sometimes you know they may not think there's much savings potential because of the sometimes the perceived small dollar value um, some companies don't think it's worth their time or effort to try to attack indirect expenses, so they'll deploy resources on more strategic activities. Uh, or some companies will think that uh, their expenses are already optimized, and we, be we believe that optimization is an unachievable end, because optimization is always improving, and there's always going to be an improvement upon your current situation, no matter how good you're doing it today. Uh, these are some brief examples, and I'm going to dive into a little more, you know, kind of uh, uh, substantive case study. Um, you know, the, the kind of the takeaway from this slide is you see, you know, a wide range of expense categories from telecommunications to express delivery to utilities, and those are the expense categories. And then you see a variety of industries that are saving money from those categories. You know, publicly traded companies, restaurant chains, hospitals, and nonprofits. So there's a lot of fragmentation, but the one commonality is the six and seven figure savings that all of them are achieving because they put the focus at the top on indirect expense. So we're gonna talk about the impact of indirect cost reduction uh, from a couple of perspectives. This is a, um, you know, an example of uh, you know, a manufacturing company. You know, obviously we're not gonna give names, but about 100 million in revenue um, 15 million in EBITDA, so the margin is about 15%. Um, identified about 12 million in annual indirect spend, and that's pretty much all inclusive of all indirect spend. And after a, a thorough effort with the help of our firm, um, they achieved about a million and a half in savings annually, and it took about six to nine months to get to this point. So I'm going to walk through two perspectives of the exact same case study. The first perspective is of the CEO, or from the CEO and CFO of the client. Again, the same results. From the client's perspective, it's a 12.5% improvement in EBITDA. Um, but if you look at a parallel at their margins, it's the equivalent of 10% or $10 million growth in sales um, with the same, you know, from a bottom line impact. And you know, I would tell you, if, you know, if we all walked into a CEO and said, we're going to increase your sales by 10%, I think 10 out of 10 of them would say, let's do it. If we walk into a CEO and say, hey, we're going to cut your indirect cost by a million dollars, about three or four out of ten will do it, just because there's not the visibility and profile of uh, that part of the business typically. The second perspective is even more powerful, and it's from the private equity firm or the financial sponsor. You know, a million and a half in indirect cost savings for a PE firm, if you apply the multiple in EBITDA, is worth 12 to 15, maybe more, depending on the multiple, a uh, million increase in enterprise value. Same, same result. In addition, it creates a network effect. So if one PE portfolio company achieves a savings, the sponsor can help the spouse taking it all across the portfolio. So, so the value, enterprise value, keeps cascading across the portfolio for the sponsor. Uh, it does, at some level, provide a competitive advantage during the due diligence stage when you can uh, you know, kind of see what the savings potential is when you're bidding on a, on a potential acquisition. And then, you know, kind of Tangentially, it helps send a very positive message to your current and potential limited partners that you're really kind of putting a, a, a layer of efficiency throughout your portfolio. So two broad perspectives on the same result. We're going to talk a little bit briefly about uh, some best practices and suggestions. I mean, realistically, we could talk all day if you, about all the tips into how to effectively do this, but at a very you know kind of high level, general level, many of these you know, suggestions and tips are probably you're probably already aware of. We're going to you know, kind of include those, include some real-life case studies briefly, so you might see four or five case studies following this, and then uh, you know, we'll drive toward uh, you know, close with a Q&A. But the very first suggestion is, for us, from our standpoint, is it need, indirect cost reduction needs to be a C-suite priority. And one way to see if it is, is the first question we ask CEOs and CFOs when we meet them, what are your indirect expenses? Now I will tell you, most of them don't know that answer. And that's not that they're mismanaging their business, it's hard to get your arms around what the expenses are in these areas. So generally speaking, if we get, you know, kind of not sure what our indirect expenses are type answer, uh, we realize or we believe that's probably the first step where to indicate there's an opportunity. 
but as the first you know kind of top suggestion it needs to be a c-suite priority and really you know from a c from a c-level you know perspective there's three things you can do you can make cost reduction an ongoing process you can make it a periodic exercise or you can do nothing um kind of a, a parallel to fitness if you want to stay fit you work out every you know, other day of the week all year long if you want to just kind of see how healthy you are you go to the doctor once a year uh, we believe that companies should continually work on getting better and better with lower costs and improved efficiencies and that's that has to be involve behavior change and comes from comes from the top the second suggestion is monitor your dollars and when we say that I mean most companies monitor their dollars but monitor down down to the line item level where every penny is going out the door in these areas uh, kind of one interesting dynamic is the companies most procurement departments are charged with you know getting the best price and services from vendors on a contract but they're not as responsible for implementing it so what happens is you get a really powerful supplier agreement with a vendor but it doesn't get implemented so therefore it doesn't impact the bottom line which means you know a lot of the effort was for naught i'm going to walk through a couple of uh, examples around this <clears throat> One is a client that had, you know, about three quarters of a million in, um, spent on industrial pallets. They uh, were successfully negotiated about $100,000 in annual cost savings and improved services from the vendor. But a year later, they figured out that only about 35% of that was being implemented. Uh, the rest of it was still being purchased from the old vendors out in the field because they haven't effectively harnessed the uh, behavior change internally. So looking at it one way, they saved $100,000 on paper, but they lost $65,000 in an opportunity because they didn't effectively track it and implement it. Second is a larger example uh, for a very large publicly traded client of ours. Spend about, spends about $15 million on telecommunications. Very successful three-year contract negotiated with one of the major carriers. It was a big celebration when it was, when it was signed. Uh, it took about six months to negotiate. Um, you know, save two million a year, which you know the purchasing exec executives were rewarded for this. Um, about 18 months into that relationship, they discovered there was still about $55,000 a month in uh, unused in charges for unused lines that were no longer supposedly in operation. So that's $650,000, $700,000 a year that was really you know, literally being thrown out the window. So fortunately, with you know kind of the detailed analysis that we're suggesting, we were able to you know kind of help, or they were able to help recover that cost and get true from the uh, you know on the on the true savings. But if someone's not watching it, that who knows that could have still might still be going on. The uh, and then kind of the last example around you know, tracking the dollars is, a, is an area most people don't realize, um, or a lot of people don't realize, is an opportunity. That's in the area of bank fees, and this was a very large franchisee of a well-known restaurant chain I had a long-term relationship with a bank um, with their credit facilities and, and discovered you know, after a thorough analysis by an expert that there was about 230 225 230 thousand dollars of overcharges or ancillary charges that should not have been charged by the bank uh, found on the bank statements and then over a period of three years and that too is an example of something once you get that knowledge um, you can you can typically recover it from the uh, from the provider so sea level priority monitor your dollars the third is you know be open to no to new vendors and uh, we tell people you know no relationship is sac should be sacrosanct um the there are so many you know in different industries there are new technologies that vendors are bringing to the table that have lower cost alternatives there's new disruption new disruptive uh, solutions that uh, suppliers bring to the table. Um, and if you're not actively kind of looking for something, you know, an improvement in your current situation, or you're not willing to change the relationship you're in, you're not going to be able to benefit from those, those type of uh, opportunities. And unfortunately for companies with limited resources in, in so many categories, the path of least resistance is just to stay with the incumbent vendors. We believe a lot of companies are missing out on opportunities to um, to improve their cost structure uh, as a result of tight relationships. A couple of examples here. One's uh, obviously uh, a very relationship-based service. It's commercial insurance. It's a client of ours in the distribution business. The previous CFO had a you know, long-standing relationship with a very very good insurance broker. 
Um, a new CFO came in and took a hard look at the details on an independent level and identified there was about 20% uh, overcharge in premiums, but even more uh, troubling to them is they weren't fully covered in the way they should have been, which is the way they thought they were. So that probably, you know, without that kind of being open to alternative solutions type philosophy by the new CFO, um, that company wouldn't have been able to benefit and participate in the in the value and increase improve their risk management as a result. Um, another quick example, and this is one that uh, people don't realize typically from our client base. Um, we had a manufacturing client that where the CEO and the owner were very close personal friends. And that relationship was, you know, in our view and in others, unbreakable. The problem and challenge was that the competitors knew that, and so competitors stopped bidding when given the opportunity because they knew they weren't going to get the business. That creates a tremendous amount of risk when this company was relying solely on one local vendor and found that other alternative solutions weren't willing to participate. And if they did, they would charge exorbitant prices because they knew they weren't going to get the business over the long haul. So sometimes tight relationships with vendors manifest itself in uh, different ways, and in this case, it was a risk management or increased risk of supply chain type perspective. The you know, next suggestion is you know, view your vendors as solution providers. Um, we tell our clients, and sometimes they look at it strange, treat the vendors the same way you treat your clients. They both contribute margin to your bottom line. And the typical indirect expense relationship involves a local or regional sales rep and a, and a department buyer. Uh, we recommend companies to really, and particularly in the important areas, engage at the senior and C-level. Um, establish key measures with them. Open your books. Tell them what the challenges are and, and challenge them as vendors to help you solve that problem. And when they know that you're totally open to communicating to them uh, their problems and challenges, they'll perceive that uh, you can lower their cost of doing business with you. Therefore, they pass that savings on. That's a very effective philosophy, and again, that's behavior change from the traditional kind of transactional relationship uh, that is fairly pervasive in, in the indirect expense area. And then kind of the last uh, of the suggestions, and this is a newer, newer element of our business, and we're very excited about it, and it, it involves employee engagement. Um, as I kind of alluded, you know, procurement has historically not been the most, you know, not as glamorous as sales, you know, as a generality. Even though, as we see, it can be it can be as impactful to the bottom line, um, we feel at times indirect expense teams can be people can be unappreciated, and they're oftentimes overworked because they have a whole lot of work for very little. Um, excuse me for you know for the whole lot of uh, suppliers that they're dealing with. So we really kind of encourage our our contacts to engage and reward the employees. And one of the things unique things we're seeing is the advent of uh, employee discount programs where uh, employees can or can save money for personal purchases off the off the back of the client contract. So, for instance, uh, if you have a really competitive cell phone contract that's leveraged based on the business's volume, vendors will offer that same discount to employees and their families. And you know, in an age where maybe you don't have the ability to raise salaries year over year, if you can have a series of of, uh, of you know commonly purchased categories that are saving money for clients, they'll realize that goes or for their employees, they'll realize that goes into their pocket and it really creates kind of an employee perk and boosts morale. And then last suggestion is a bit self-serving, um, but we have the audience. Uh, and, and the theme here on a on a week of a you know professional golf event is even the pros have swing coaches. No matter how effective you might be as a business consider you know consider a third party opinion uh, whether it's us or somebody else there are others we are, we feel like we're at the top but there are other really good firms that can help you achieve the type of results that we talked about in this um, in this presentation many of them are performance based so if they don't deliver there's no um, really cost to the organization so it's a fairly low risk proposition and we would encourage you to consider you know reaching out to um, third party experts if you have any doubt about the, uh, what the potential savings might be for you, or you're concerned about the level of resources that you have. Um, I think now it's time for the Q&A session. Um, John, I guess you'll read the questions. Yeah, um, well, thanks very much, first of all, Miles. We, we, we very much appreciate it. What, what's your process 
when you when you're engaged, what, what's your process going into an organization? Um, who do you work with? How long does it take? You know, can, can you explain that to us? Sure, that's a you know that's a, a great question. Um, initially, you know, the first step in our process is to do a kind of a detailed review of what the annual spending is and, and kind of compartmentalize it by category. And then we you know, we have a proprietary way of assessing where we think the greatest opportunities are, and we use that assessment as a means to you know have a dialogue with the company to see if it's worth moving forward or not. Once we you know do move forward with the client, there's you know kind of the first phase is heavy analytical, and then the last phase is really kind of just measuring the savings to make sure the client knows it's going to the bottom line. Um, so, you, but it all starts with the data. We have a tremendous amount of data that we analyze down to the you know literally the line item level with every client, and we measure that and we measure the savings off of that, and that verification is what is why the clients you know really that's why we have a high repeat amount of repeat business because clients want us to continually keep measuring the savings for them because they aren't able to on their own usually how long does it take typically in a process with the client you, 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 if you start if you had a client you were starting with tomorrow are you going to be working with them for one month two months six months is it very intense at the beginning and then it and then it becomes a regular check-in you know at what, what type of team members do they have to allocate to working with you so uh typically well the you know they they part in partial answer to that is it does depend it depends on the size of the company and the number of locations they have and the and the decision structure is it centralized or decentralized uh, some engagements with large companies can take as long as, you know, four months from start to implementation. And sometimes there might be binding contracts that even delay it further. In some engagements, we can do it a lot quicker. It just depends on the structure. Uh, norm, most always the um, uh, key point person is the CFO or CEO. Uh, we do have tight alliances with the financial sponsors or PE firms along the way. And so it's very collaborative in that regard. Um, and, you know, the, the most important thing, and, and generally speaking, we will initially find some internal resistance in a client, you know, afraid that this may look, make them look bad. But, but, you know, as a rule, we really become advocates for the staff and the employees. It just sometimes takes a little time to break that ice. And we, to, you know, the quicker that ice is broken, the quicker we can all start implementing results. How often do you, do you circle back with your clients to revisit and check in with them? So um, we, once a client engagement is over, we generally get a renewal in new categories that maybe we didn't uh, engage initially. So there's usually a continuum. Our normal engagement is 24 months. And the after, if we haven't, don't have any activity with the client after 12 months post, um, you know, termination of the agreement or expiration of the agreement, um, we will uh, go back to them and, and uh, try to you know, see if they are interested in re-engagement. But what will happen normally is they'll keep adding more and more to us, so those 24-month cycles keep keep extending the relationship. Some of our largest clients have been clients of ours since 2012. Got it. And for for our audience out there, some 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 pointers for them. Are there typical low-hanging fruit items that no matter what type of a business that you're working with, you go in and you say, you know what, we're going to right away look in these in these particular areas because most of the time we're able to find uh, cost savings. There are, and we break it down based on the type of business. Um, you know, certainly, you know, manufacturing and, and um, service companies are going to have a slightly different set of categories, but a lot of the front office administrative supplies and services that are common across all all companies. Uh, you know, your telecommunication, your express mail your payroll processing, categories of that nature. IT and telecom is very uh, interesting because the technology keeps driving the cost to the bottom, and, and so it's a great, it's a really kind of fruitful category to look at. Yeah, so those, those are kind of some of the obvious ones. We have a set of, you know, five or six that we can pretty much do a quick strike if needed and, and almost always hit the double-digit plus percentage. And are you negotiating on behalf of your clients with those with those vendors or are you recommending new vendors 
or do you have preferred relationships with vendors of your own that you're able to refer in? How does that work? Yeah, so we have uh, we do leverage our volume across our network to to offer high high volume leverage supply contracts. And if our clients choose to piggyback on those and purchase on those immediately, they have that opportunity. But conversely, in addition to that, if a client wants a customized analysis that may not involve a vendor that is in our network, we will negotiate on their behalf based on their business, their volume, their data, and uh, we'll take all the heavy lifting uh, kind of off their plate and bring the savings result to them, reporting to them as we were as if we were an employee, and um, and then following their you know approval and modification of our you know recommendations. So, so so tell us, Miles, what are some of the reasons that these um, indirect cost reduction efforts fail? Yeah, that um, you know to us the the very first tip that we you kind of talked about if if it's not really if, if the C suite doesn't make it part of kind of behavior change internally and doesn't make it a top priority that increases the likelihood that it either you know won't succeed or it will succeed very slowly. So, so, so what you're saying is even though the you're being brought in, say, by the CFO of an organization, because there isn't buy-in from the CEO, there's a higher chance that the cost reduction efforts will fail. No, I, and I apologize if it wasn't clear. I think the the more the issue is if that buy-in isn't kind of you know kind of pervasive throughout the organization. If it's just more of a something on a task list for the CFO or CEO that they support versus some, you know, getting the troops together and saying, look, this is something that we're all very serious about and make it a priority. Though that's, a, that's kind of a distinguishing you know, factor in, in, that we look at and we see. Um, so, so strong CEO and CFO endorsement. The other one, which I didn't mention, is data. If they don't have good data or they don't have, um, you know, if, if, if it's difficult to get access to the data, then that, that either slows the process down or makes it, you know, very difficult to show savings. Gotcha. So, so when you do have these challenges, how do you get those internal people, those internal stakeholders to, to buy into it, to change their behavior? Really need to sit down and listen to their challenges and help, you know, kind of break through any concerns they may have and, and try to help bring solutions that meet those challenges because in the end we're going to make their, their life easier when it's all said and done. And that might be you know, kind of a different approach than a, maybe a traditional buying group approach where you just subscribe to a contract and then move on. Um, our model is, is catered or centered around deep implementation and part of that is getting using data to get the internal stakeholders to know that um, this is something that's going to make their job easier and make them do it better. How do you measure, so this goes back to the data, I would guess, how do you measure and verify that these savings actually hits the bottom line? We have a, and this is probably the, you know, kind of the secret sauce of our business. Um, we have a very detailed and unique uh, way and methodology and deliverable of doing that, that, uh, you know, can can identify, you know, without a doubt, whether the savings is uh, hits the bottom line or not at the line item level, whether it's a one dollar purchase or a ten thousand dollar purchase, and it's something we don't do once or twice a year. We do it every month, and we're constantly watching where those dollars are going on behalf of the client, because quite frankly, the clients don't our clients don't have the time to do it on their own. A lot of um, kind of other solution providers, and again, there are a lot of good ones out there we feel don't go to level of detail to make sure the impact hits the bottom line as late as much as we do. Sure. So, so, so tell us, how do you set yourselves apart from these other solution providers, from other, comp from other competitors? I think the, you know, the biggest metric that we track is the amount of savings that's negotiated, the, there's a much higher percent of it is actually going to flow through to the bottom line. Um, and part of it is I think other solutions don't measure it the way we do. And um, and again, that's nothing negative. It's there are multiple good multiple solutions out there. But but if you know we said that one example earlier where there's a hundred thousand dollars savings in pallets, but only thirty five thousand of it went through to the bottom line. 
that's unacceptable in our world. We would have picked that up very early and uh, gotten that up to at least 95 95% of the total savings number, hitting the bottom line. How, how do you work with clients that are in, that have contracts with vendors that, that are, you know, they still have a couple of years to go and they're, they're bad contracts. How do you renegotiate them? How do you, how do you get them to be renegotiated? <laughs> uh, great question. See that a lot. Um, the, uh, you know, depending on where the vendor and client are in that contract, um, they, you know, you, you have, you do have a range of options. If it's near the sunset of the contract, that vendor isn't going to want to lose the business, even if it's, you know, nine months out for expiration, nor are they very, you know, going to want to kind of look bad. Um, so more often than not, they're going to be willing to come back to the table preemptively. If it's in the first, you know, six to nine months or the first third of a contract, you know, quite honestly, a lot of times they're kind of locked in. And, um, you know, we, we try to help them and we try to help them measure the savings and try to help them improve the existing relationship to the extent we can. But if it's a newly signed contract, unfortunately, and it's not a good one, um, you, you might be stuck with it yeah. for a little while. Right. Um, anything else for our audience today that, that – uh um, that you can provide them with some some tips, some some, some suggestions um, to, to to help them you know, reduce these costs, to manage yeah. these costs. Yeah, um, you know, I, I would say if you're a business owner out there or a CEO, CFO, you know, ask yourself the question: What are our expenses? And then, you know, have either somebody internally or or somebody externally come in and, and help verify your assumptions. Are you really maximizing the value for your company? or um, or not, and I, that, that can be a fairly, in our world, you can measure results. It's not like some other implementations where it's very hard to measure. There is a clear scoreboard, how much you're saving, and um, that, uh, that's something we can, we can pick up and others can pick up for you. So I would, I would highly encourage you know, executives to take inventory and see what, um, what the savings, you know, what they think the spend is. If you're a private equity sponsor, you know, obviously there's a whole, you know, order magnitude level of potential benefit. And I know the same thing applies. How much of the savings that your, your portfolio companies are achieving actually is flowing through to the bottom line? Because if you can prove that it's hitting the bottom line, that obviously can be used in multiple ways uh, beyond just a P&L perspective. And does, does, uh, does Alliance cost practice what they, what they preach and they sell? Do you, do you, do you implement internally the same practices that you that you coach and you work with your clients on absolutely but you know what we can always save more as i said earlier optimization is not an in, an absolute end it's a it's a constant you know striving for something better there's always something more optimal and we're always looking for it and we're not perfect no one is do you ever go back to clients uh, you, you you'll discover you know uh, i don't know something uh from you know, that you learned while working at one client and it'll, uh, you know, trigger you to go back to a client that you worked with a year ago and say, you know what, we've recently learned this and discovered this, discovered this, you, you know, you may want to take a look at, at this area as well. We certainly do. And particularly, you know, we have a, a wide range of existing live clients right now. So if we see a best practice from one client, we'll go back and, and, and instruct our, you know, leaders, executive leaders to, to, to discuss it with um, with the executives of the other teams, and is that you know specifically that bank fee example is one that is being reviewed in multiple levels right now, um, and that was a you know that was kind of a, a learning that uh, you know was fairly recent. Um, for new clients, you know if, if they're kind of considering whether to work with us or not, we'll we'll pro pose a question uh, around the new solution and see if there's a match or not. Well, Miles, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think this this was uh, for me. For me, I know it was very helpful. Uh, for those of you who are listening in, if you if you have any further questions for Miles, um, we are going to send out these slides to everybody tomorrow. We'll act. We'll have a, a replay of this webinar, that, a link to that, which will also be sent to you. Uh, Miles, Miles's and uh, and ACC's contact information will be there. You can also feel free to. Uh, to reach out to us uh, here at uh, Star Mountain as, as well. Um, you could also email us at webinars at Star Mountain Capital. Miles, 
Um, we very much appreciate it. Thanks very much for, for uh, getting this done in a manageable amount of time. You know, we felt in the past that when we've you know, had longer webinars that, uh, that, that people have time constraints. So, so getting this done in you know, 40 minutes-ish was, uh, and I know you had a lot of content and it's hard, but it's very much appreciated. Well, thank you, John. We appreciate your partnership and I look forward to seeing you soon. Yeah, and for those uh, for those of you that are that are still logged in, uh, thanks again. And uh, we're going to have another webinar in two weeks on June 27th, where uh, where Dr. Lev is back, Dr. Lev Bordowski, and he's going to give his quarterly update regarding global macro currents and and the lower middle market. Uh, thanks very much, everybody. Again, we're going to email you tomorrow with the webinar replay and the slides, and uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. Thank you.